This program is called Absence of Moral Leadership. For five years, Francis Sullivan led the Catholic Church's Truth, Justice and Healing Council during the Australian Royal Commission into Child Sexual Abuse. Francis says that wherever there have been public inquiries into the Catholic Church response to child sexual abuse, they have found that church officials place the interests of the institution, its assets and reputation before the welfare of children and the obligations of the law. British theologian Linda Woodhead complements this talk by exploring the ways abusers use the cultures and structures of faith communities to facilitate, legitimate, justify and hide abuse. Child sexual abuse in the Catholic Church has corroded Episcopal power, made a mockery of the institution's moral leadership, and scandalised ordinary Catholics worldwide. The crimes of abuse and cover-up have laid bare the craven self-interest of the institution, the arrogance of its leadership, and the blatant disregard for the laws of the land. Wherever there have been public inquiries into the Catholic Church response to child sexual abuse, assault and rape, there have been findings that the church officials placed the interests of the institution, its assets and reputation before the welfare of children and the obligations of the law. An all too familiar scenario has characterized the sex abuse scandal. Victims were disbelieved and intimidated. Church officials were found to have obfuscated, even lied to protect offending priests and religious. Financial reparations were modest at best, inconsistently applied, and subject to confidentiality clauses. An atmosphere of secrecy dominated the management of abuse cases. Allegations of child sexual assault were generally not reported to police and public authorities. Known perpetrators were shifted to new posts where unsuspecting parishioners and students became their prey. Clericalism ensured a lack of accountability and transparency. And even though Church records of abuse cases were kept by church authorities dating back at least 70, if not more, years. It has only been in recent times that the extent and scope of the nature of the abuse and its cover-up has been made public through the insistence of public authorities not the honesty of the institution. The cover-up culture has had an insidious effect. Without doubt, far less children would have been the subject of sexual abuse if accountability, transparency, lawfulness and honesty were features of the institution's response to abuse allegations. Let's face it, being associated with the Catholic Church is a cause for shame. There is a collective shadow we all cast. But who has been responsible? 
bishops, religious leaders, and senior church officials exercised power ruthlessly and victims were oppressed and truth was repressed. Public inquiries consistently found a failure in leadership, in many cases at the highest levels of the institution, and sadly, even today there are reports echoing the same allegation. They also point to the culture of the institution as a significant contributing factor. Coming to terms with the culture is the Rubicon that must be crossed if we want to learn the lessons of the abuse scandal. Cultural anthropologists, particularly Father Gerald Arbuckle, stress that unless we understand how culture works, we are doomed to fail in any serious endeavour for change. So how would we describe the culture of the church? Well, put simply, culture is what we do. But Jerry Arbuckle would say it's more than that. It is primarily what we feel about what we do. It gives the comforting feeling of order and belonging when faced with a chaotic world. It clings to us in ways that we are rarely conscious. It is the safety net in times of confusion, stress or trauma. In subtle ways, it, in, it inhibits personal agency and in turn controls ethical boundaries. The church has many microcultures, you know, for example, schools, parishes, health and social services have distinct cultures within the broader accepted culture of the church. However, the features of those cultures have a logical consistency. Power and authority are based on a concept of religious belief and in turn, compliance. Allegiance to the institution or the congregation or even the parish is aligned with a personal religious commitment to one's faith and its obligations. So in a very real sense, participating in being church, whether in institutional roles like being a cleric or an administrator, or as a member of a faith community like a parish or a religious congregation, this is a deeply personal expression of identity and purpose. And as a consequence, when that identity and meaning making is threatened, defensiveness comes to the fore. The abuse scandal has been analyzed from the perspective of the church as an institution with its attendant features, namely a hierarchical structure, its own internal legal system, a clerical caste, and a dominant male class. As Arbuckle counsels, this has a culture and the culture has a life of its own. Its language is silent and it is forever active in new manifestations that resists attempts 
of eradication. That is, unless we confront the cover-up culture, name it for what it is, actively displace the underlying myths and beliefs that fuel dysfunction, we are at risk of it prevailing in ever new and potent ways. Arbuckle, along with others, describes the culture that gave rise to and concealed child sexual abuse as being both corrupt and systemic. As such, those responsible for the scandal are those who oversaw a system and its processes that were in turn corrupt. That is why the church must not be able to investigate itself, nor keep any of its internal processes of complaint handling at a distance from the law. Catholics have struggled with the reality that some bishops, religious leaders and church officials have been corrupt. The leaders themselves have been shocked that their behaviour is seen as being corrupt. This speaks volumes about the culture in which the behaviour occurred. The fact that otherwise decent people can be blind to their actions such that they apparently fail to see the evil implication of their decisions demonstrates how powerfully the culture of compliance to the interests of the institution can work. That the culture can portray loyalty as a priority above all else, even the welfare of vulnerable children, indicates how an institution's values shape the mindset and instincts of its adherents, particularly in times of crisis and threat. For example, see how intractable the church hierarchy are to amending the protocols of the sacrament of confession. When a child tells a priest in the sacrament that they have been abused, they are not confessing their sin. Yet the Roman Curia insists that this information cannot be shared by the priest under the threat of breaking the seal of confession, even though the seal does not apply to a child sharing information about a sin perpetrated on them. The intransigence and relegation of the welfare of the child to the interests of the institution makes a mockery of the rhetoric church leavers mouth in front of TV cameras and in public inquiries. If they genuinely wanted to respect the dignity and worth of the child, they would find a way through the dilemma. Even when the church has been challenged to do so, it dismisses the protocol and proposal outright and then plays the culture wars card and the need for religious freedom. Meanwhile, the trust of the community continues to wane. It was this collective mindset that facilitated the cover-ups and concealments. It was the same mindset that sought to excuse bishops and leaders whilst being careful not to excuse the perpetrators. It's the mindset that tried to spin that the issue was about a few bad apples in the bunch. 
It was a mindset that refused to accept that it was about the culture and the abuse of power. This is the mindset that is determined to safeguard the institution and stave off necessary reform. Of course, within that culture, there were and still are individuals with their own moral compass. The records show that clergy and religious did speak out on occasions, did object to the treatment of victims, and often they did leave in protest. But the reality is that the weight of the culture to comply, to turn a blind eye, to rationalise, even excuse, was so suffocating that the corruption continued unabated. The revelations of abuse and its management has eroded trust in bishops and leaders. Frankly, they alone are incapable of addressing the cultural questions. Only a collective effort, laity and clergy, signed on to a process of reform, will have any chance of remediating the defects of the culture. So we need to move into a period of intentional disruption. This is best done in a public and accountable fashion. Dioceses should immediately establish cultural audits with specific terms of engagement that examine the everyday workings of the church in all its manifestations. The results need to be made public and be open for public discussion. It is a starting point and not an end in itself. Substantial reform requires a commitment for change that is prepared to risk identity and reputation, pursue a refounding in integrity, and tolerate the loss of adherents who can't make the journey. The institution needs to shed the implicit assumptions and beliefs that cause violence, abuse and cover-up. This requires identifying those attitudes that condone ruthless behaviour, expedient approaches to vulnerable people and lying to save the institution. It must acknowledge and address how power is exercised, how participation in decision-making is manipulated, and by whom. It needs to demonstrate how the dependency on a rigid identity and institutional character perpetuates a culture that disenfranchises adherence, denies wrongdoing, protects the powerful, and instills secrecy as a working assumption. It needs to acknowledge those myths and stories that are false and lead to evil outcomes. For example, notions such as a judgmental God that only leads to persecution and despair, or concepts like intrinsically disordered sexuality that discriminates and demonizes. Arbuckle and others counsel that strategy alone will not suffice. Culture is too powerful and regenerative to be contained just by a 
few new protocols and practices. Because culture always fights back, clouding the truth and keeping unconscious that which must be brought into the light. Confronting the institution is a perilous task. This is particularly so when the institution is in a state of trauma. Australian Bishop, the late Geoffrey Robinson, famously wrote that to get to the core of the corrupt cover-up culture, the church must confront its approach to power and sex. He was castigated in conservative circles, yet vindicated by all public inquiries. The abuse of power and the jaundiced attitude towards sex have rendered the institution increasingly ossified in its pastoral and mission activities. His siren call was aggressively hushed because too many people in positions of power, comfort and entitlement feared the collapse of the house of cards. The upshot is a church in despair. The disenchantment of the laity with the institution has left the Episcopal leadership confused and frightened. The active pursuit of civil and criminal claims by victims has senior officials defensive and paranoid, concerned or obsessed over the future assets of the church. The loss of public esteem and corruption in their ranks has the clergy demoralised and disorganised. The Catholic community is shocked and increasingly voting with their feet. Participation in weekend worship is dropping at alarming rates. With the loss of trust in bishops and the clergy, it is now left to the laity to drive the change. Insist on co-responsible governance of dioceses. The same in church ministries, so that a relevant pastoral engagement will characterize the presence of Catholicism in our world. This paradigm shift in governance will be resisted. If for no other reason than bishops fear that sharing governance responsibilities is somehow to lose authority. That fear is based on the assumptions that underpin any hierarchical structure. That is, those at the top have the authority, regardless of competency or capability. It must be said that to be blindly loyal to the hierarchical, patriarchal institution, as if it's God's will for the church, is a modern-day heresy. Moreover, it embeds a veto mentality on behalf of the bishops. It instills a sense of intimidation for subordinates and hesitancy to question and critique. It builds a dysfunctional notion of loyalty and ultimately breeds a disposition of passivity and compliance regardless of the facts or circumstances. This type of culture finds no place for accountability and transparency. Rather, it marks success in terms of the eradication of conflict and the quashing of dissent. It turns religious instruction into ideology 
religious identity into political posturing and religious affiliation into a character test. Our church is at a low ebb. The scandal has shown how venal the institution can be. The loss of trust threatens to widen and split the church between those seeking change and those clinging to a pre-Vatican II styled hierarchy and medieval structure. We need to embark on the slow, arduous task of cultural reform. The scandal has broken the heart of the church. Catholics intuitively know that the church has not acted in a way consistent with the gospel. Reform must be based on the gospel. It must be spirit-led. We must put on the mind of Christ, not the mentality of a corporate risk management. In practical terms, some fundamentals are required. One, reform is not merely a political exercise as much as it is a desire for authenticity and integrity in the light of the gospel. Two, bishops and leaders need to sign on to reform. Without those in positions of authority being fully on board, the tensions for change will split the church rather than heal and grow the faith community. Thirdly, reform is a process of co-responsibility. That is, laity and clergy, equally involved in all stages of analysis and decision-making. Synodality employed properly can facilitate mutual discernment. Fourthly, canon law should reflect the discerned directions for the church in the structural changes and pastoral practice, rather than limiting the imagination of the faithful. The methodology to address reform needs to also be outlined. And here are some working assumptions that might be helpful. Firstly, best practice organisational and cultural insights should be applied to church structures and processes. It is not enough to settle with a mantra that says only those who understand ecclesiology get the gig. We're talking about a human institution where human best practices, understandings and knowledge and experience have some role. Secondly, wherever possible, democratise in decision-making, say in appointment processes, and certainly in financial accountabilities. Resist instilling a hierarchical structure that bleaches accountability from processes. Thirdly, integrate gender balance and diversity at all levels 
of governance. Fourthly, encourage and facilitate public scrutiny and reporting. Be honest, open and transparent. And fifthly, function as an open as opposed to closed system. Most importantly, reform and its practice needs to be nourished and directed by a spirituality that is open, humble and searching. As a faith community, that means humility. The good news is that a lot of the groundwork for change has already been done. Well-considered pathways to achieve greater accountability and transparency in governance and management have already been outlined. Post the Royal Commission in Australia, the bishops and religious leaders commissioned an examination into diocesan and other church governance and management structures. The resulting Light from the Southern Cross report provides practical and far-reaching recommendations that shift the paradigm from a hierarchical culture reliant on the residue of clerical privilege to a more synodal culture of mutual participation between laity and clergy in models of co-responsible governance. So, you know, why insist on the governance shift? Governance is ultimately about how we, the stewardship of the church. And integral to that stewardship are the teachings and pastoral outreach that are relevant and engaging of contemporary life. Lay women and men, just as much as clergy and religious, are capable sources and resources of experience and wisdom that can inform good decision-making and sound foundations for teaching and pastoral practice. We must actively engage the insights from the physical and human sciences, including cosmology and ecological understandings, which will better ground our theology, particularly about the human person, and in turn break down discrimination and exclusion. It will provide the foundations for a more relational-based moral theology. It will provide a respect for gender that insists on equality. And it will encourage a democratic and inclusive style of governance across the board. This sets the church on a new course, more relevant for the postmodern times and less clerical. It frees up the faithful to better hear the cries of the spirit and more creatively respond to the missionary impulse, Pope Francis says, is our clarion call. Too many people have been abused in the Catholic Church. Too many vulnerable children. Their lives, in many cases, were irreparably damaged. We need to see them as our present day prophets. Their experience is speaking back into our reality. There is a voice that is powerful and important. It is a voice like the spirit 
that is formative and telling. Our responsibility, our obligation is not only to listen, but to acknowledge that that voice is the voice of the spirit. It is the formative voice, the creative voice, the voice that asks of us, when I was naked, did you see me? It is the voice that says to us today, you are capable, you have what it takes, shape the church in the heart of Christ. And we need to do it as a responsible re reaction to what the history of abuse has demonstrated to us. For people tonight who unfortunately have too much proximity to the abuse scandal or to the experience themselves, I sincerely hope that if anything I've said has upset you, that there is some support nearby. Thank you very much.
to God our Father, the Most High God, the Triune God who dwells in unapproachable light. O oh God, our help in the time of trouble. Oh God, we ask, oh Lord, that you would shine your light of truth, oh Lord, over every dark shadow of wickedness in this land within us, oh God. We ask, oh Lord, that you would help us to cast down every idol and every false place in this land, oh God until you are glorified, until your love is made manifest fully and completely here on earth, oh God. We cry out to you, Father. You are the only one who can deliver. You are the only one that can save us, oh Lord God, from the wickedness that so easily entangles us and besets us, oh God. Be glorified. You are our God. You are our deliverer. And we trust and we wait with a spirit of expectation, knowing, oh God, that you will deliver us, oh Lord, that you, oh Lord, will illuminate the shadows, oh God, that your light, your bright light of love and truth will shine like the new day. We pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. Today I'm mainly going to draw on the very substantial materials that were produced by the Irish, Australian and English and Welsh inquiries into child sexual abuse. So the examples I'm going to give are in the public domain in, in, in those in the documents of those inquiries. I'm going to look down at the micro level at how abusers use institutional settings to abuse. So two parts, the weapons and the armour of the abuser. Um, but let me just start with a quick statistic. Aggregated studies show that as many as one in five women and one in 20 men experience sexual abuse at some time in their lives, and more experience bullying. One in five women, one in 20 men. Uh, and we also know that around 95% of perpetrators are male of sexual abuse, about 95% are male. Um, the family is the most common context for sexual abuse, and a known person is most likely to abuse. Uh, a couple of important things, I think, follow from those numbers for us. One, you know, it's statistically likely that in our group here now on Zoom, many people will have first-hand experience of abuse, uh, and perhaps there will be one or two of perpetrating, have experience of perpetrating abuse. I don't think we should be naive about that. And abusers learn from talks like these and um, benefit from getting on to safeguarding committees and projects looking into abuse and things like that. I'll explain why. Um, the other thing that follows from statistics is that Abuse in the family or abuse in an in a, um, industrial school, like Gordon mentioned in Ireland, doesn't have to be very subtle. You can literally, and there are horrible stories of it, you can literally jump on um, a child. They are trapped in that, set, um, in that setting. The kinds of abuse in religious institutional settings that um, are more common and that we're looking at require more subtlety the perpetrators have to prepare more carefully because these are voluntary groups and people can, in theory, exit from them and report on what is happening. So the abuse has to be, in a sense, cleverer abuse. And that's what I want to talk about. So other than just straightforward abuse, uh, sorry, assault, uh, violent assault, what are the weapons that an abuser can use, particularly in an institutional context? Number one, um, probably pretty obvious, the use of authority, esteem, and or charisma. It can just be institutional authority. You know, the abuser is a clergy person um, or a bishop. They're high up. They've got that authority from their position. Or it can be a different type of authority and power, which is charismatic. Charming is a good word. Abusers are often charming, and the aim is to enchant you, 
you know, casting a spell over you. And abusers will often have genuinely admirable traits and achievements. You look up to them. Um, there's a seduction involved very often. It's not just coercion. Yeah. Sometimes there's a devious game between abuser and, and the abused in that both are getting something out of it. Both are using one another, but the abused is in a much lesser position of power. You know, proverbially, the casting couch. You saw that with the Weinstein abuse. Uh, and then that can be weaponized against them to make them feel complicit because they were having to do it to further their career. Um, but it doesn't mean that they are equally um, uh, to be blamed, of course, but, but the abuser can often make it seem that way and bystanders. So secondly, a second weapon, the use of religious, let's call them power objects, sacraments, divine grace, demons, scriptures. Abusers in religious settings often use these things to, to control using the idea of demon possession uh, can be used, for example. Um, but also to justify what's happening and to protect yourself if you're accused. We know that Bishop Peter Ball in the Anglican Church or John Smythe, also in the Anglican Church in England, um, used teachings about the mortification of the flesh, monastic teachings, ideas about penances, um, ideas about using the rod to discipline children. All these were used to justify beatings and, and, and other forms of abuse. Um, we've spoken to some um, Jehovah's Witnesses talking about the use of scriptures like 1 Timothy, where you need two to three witnesses uh, before you can bring a charge of abuse. Thirdly, third weapon, normalization. Uh, perpetrators often work quite hard to make the abuse seem normal and by, by making sort of gradual steps in it, you make it seem normal. Brian Devlin, who are who exposed the abuse of Cardinal Keith O'Brien in Scotland in the Catholic Church, has a book called Cardinal Sin, in which he talks very well about how, um, um, rather hauntingly, about how Keith O'Brien gradually, by getting him into his office, study, offering him spiritual advice and counsel, and then just taking one step, and then laying on hands, and then embracing him, get more full-on abuse how slow the process was. It's a bit like raising the temperature in the proverbial frog in the warm water. And there's not an obvious point at which a victim can scream and jump out. Fourthly, fourth, my fourth and final weapon, blurred boundaries. Um, a lot of the abuse we're hearing about works through blurring boundaries. Sometimes it's about getting into your private space, what's public and what's private. Is sharing a car, is that getting into your private space? Sharing a hotel room, um, bathrooms becoming sites for abuse. You know, these, these blurry boundaries of private and public space. Healing as a space for abuse because touching, spiritual touching, then breaking the boundary that you'd normally say, don't touch me. Um, entering into your energy <coughs> in Tibetan Buddhism. That practice being used to enter into the psychic energy of another person. Talking about a religious group as a family, that really blurs boundaries. Talking about a religious leader as a father or a mother and you as a child or a sheep, very blurry boundaries again. Confessing your deepest sins, talking about what's going wrong in your own sexual relationship with your partner, uh, which, which, which people in religious authority might do, blurs a boundary. So those are my four weapons. As I say, I'll put them up again, but let me talk now about the armour, the abuser's armour. Well, as weapons, abusers make use of institutions to build protection around themselves, I think in a very often conscious, calculating way. And this will protect them if it comes to it, that they are exposed um, and accused of abuse. So I'm going to number them again, because I am a nerd. So number one, being in a religious institution, of course, gives someone the authority and legitimacy and it pays them. So this is important. Uh, some people are being paid to perpetrate. But there's more than that that institutions offer by way of armour. Uh, a second thing is to cultivate powerful friends. This is often done. We see this over and over again by abusers. 
Make sure you're surrounded by powerful friends. So if you need them, you can draw on them. Here's Bishop Peter Ball again. He had a law lord ringing the police, asking them to drop the case against him. He had Prince Charles writing in. He had Archbishop Carey um, hiding letters from six separate disclosures from the police. Um, um, so very, very highly placed people protect him. The third thing abusers often do is become indispensable to the institution. Again, this is to do with charisma, and you know, often they're people who um, they've got, become so indispensable that exposing them is going to be very embarrassing widely. That's partly true for Keith O'Brien, Cardinal Keith O'Brien, very charismatic Catholic in Scotland. Fourthly, in the armory, fourthly, implicate others. Abusers often let things slip. And if you don't, then, you know, if you don't, you might be perfectly innocent in the institution, but you've heard something, you didn't act on it. You've become a kind of accomplice, makes it much harder later on to get involved and stand up. Um, bragging about victims in front of them and a third party, that's the technique that abusers use. Um, we heard about that in, if any of you saw a TV program, The Church's Deadly Secret, about um, Peter Hall and the Church of England about how <clears throat> kind of um, other people who, they may or may not know that they're all abusers, but they would sit a victim on the knee, on their knee in front of another person or um, this kind of bragging really about what you're doing or calling another abuser, my dear friend, in front of a victim who's been abused by both. Fifthly, in the armory, Discredit your accusers, and this can be done before, um, as a protection, you know, even before that accuser might not have said anything about you, but you can just use gossip innuendo and institutional tools like reports and references to sow little suggestions that victims are, you know, a little unstable or, or something that undermines them um, gently. Uh, you can whisper confidential, confidentially, I can't talk about this. But um, I do know things about this person that are quite disturbing. That kind of talk is cleverly undermining. You can pull on it later and if you need to, let's try to say something about it. And sixthly and finally, um, in the armory, create a fog of confusion, a cloak of fogginess. Perpetrators, perpetrators use slippery talk and slippery thinking very hard to pin down. If they're accused, they often have very clever techniques. They slip through the net over and over again. They throw up smoke screens. They do things like produce a vast amount of wearing, confusing evidence and counter evidence. So very forensic and everyone gets absolutely exhausted and crushed by the amount of evidence they're bringing. Admitting some things, so they look really honest, but not the really bad ones. Um, insinuating, mitigating things, that it was all in a good cause, or there were reasons why it had to happen, or it's for the sake of the institution, and so on. Um, we can call it gaslighting as well as fullness. And people involved, including, including the victims, you, need, you end up not knowing what's real and what's not real, and distrusting yourself, and it all becomes very hard to pin down. Finally, concluding, there has been an evolution in how we think about abuse. It used to be, oh, it's really about sex, either sexual perverts. The next step was thinking, actually, no, this is about power over other people. Now we've got, a, what, what, what sort of power? Power is a very broad thing. Um, we've all got power of some kinds. I've got power as a professor. Um, power can be used for good and bad. So what kind of power is an abuser after? Coercion and control and the legislation around that, I think, is a further really important step in understanding what kind of power. There is a kick that people get out of controlling people. That's a very specific use of power. Some, some enjoyment, abuse can be just the enjoyment of the sheer control of something, total control. But I want to add to that another word, and that is cruelty. I think, disturbingly, that for some abusers, cruelty has to be part of how we understand what they're getting out of it and what they're doing. And a book, um, this is a popular book you might have seen on, on the, you know, um, in W.H. Smith um, by a forensic psychologist called um, Dr. Adshead, and her book is called The Devil You Know. 
And she talks about um, the, the, the absolute flood of child porn online. And she says, why are so many people, including doctors and professional people, looking at child porn? And she talks about cruelty and what is it in human nature that makes it enjoyable um, to be cruel to another um, uh, weaker person. So in conclusion, it says in the film Spotlight, if it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a village to abuse a child.